Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a wood carving knife. So recently, a friend of mine did me a favor and uh, I just wanted to do something nice in return. She's interested in uh, wood carving, and so I thought, well, that'd be cool. Uh, you know, an opportunity for me to make a kind of knife that I really haven't made in the past, a wood carving knife. So this is a knife that can be used for, you know, general whittling or wood carving or more specific things like chip carving. So a couple things that I think are kind of cool about this video. We're actually going to do a pair of videos. This one, I'm going to make this knife with absolutely no power tools. And then the second video, which is going to be sort of a follow-up to this, I'm going to do a very, very similar knife, but that one we're going to use all the fancy professional gizmos that I've got in the shop here. You know, one of the big things that I really like talking about is that everybody starts this kind of hobby wherever they are. Sometimes people get afraid that they, you know, are going to need all sorts of professional tools and fancy belt grinders and mills and all this kind of stuff in order to make a knife. Not so. So the proof is in the pudding and we're going to show in these two videos how you can make two very very similar knives. Um, the end results are going to be much the same. One of them takes about twice as long to do but it's not going to change the quality of the ultimate knife that comes out of it. Alright, let's jump right on into it. Since this is a knife for woodworkers, hey, let's start with wood. In this case, I'll be choosing an exotic wood called Paduke for the handle. I'll be using a small piece of stock just a little bigger than the handle itself. In order to do the next step, which is to cut a slot in the handle blank, I'll need to know the thickness of the steel I'm using. Now, if you're going to follow along and maybe do this project yourself, I want you to be able to do the heat treating. That's kind of in keeping with the low-tech, do-it-yourself, anybody can do this kind of vibe for this particular video. So. I've chosen a piece of 1 16th inch thick 1095 high carbon steel for the blade stock. We'll talk about the steel and why I chose it a little bit more later. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and cut the slot where the blade's tang will fit. I'm just using an old hand saw that my wife inherited from her father, who inherited it from his father. The kerf for the saw is almost exactly the same as the thickness of the steel. I'll just cut down about an inch and a half, taking care to make the bottom as flat as possible so that the tang can anchor firmly against the wood. Then I'll smooth out the interior a little with 80 grit sandpaper backed by an old hacksaw blade. Now I'll drill two 1 8 inch holes which will be used to pin the blade inside the handle. No electricity, right? I'm using a brace and bit for the drill. Now this gives me an opportunity to address the question of why I'm doing this project in the first place using no electricity. Well, first it's just a fun challenge. But on top of that, I figure anybody who enjoys handcrafts should give a little tip of the cap every now and then to our forebears who did this stuff entirely with human muscle. In my shop, I've got at least six or seven electrically powered gizmos that can drill a hole, ranging from a tiny Dremel to a multi-thousand dollar milling machine. But look here, we can do the same job in a surprisingly short time with a tool that could have been seen in any woodworking shop two or three hundred years ago. Do I use tools like this all the time? Nope. But it's always satisfying when I do. Now I'll start shaping the blade. This will be done mostly with a file, though depending on the size of my stock, I can also use a hacksaw to trim some excess material. I've used pins to locate exactly where the tang is 
so that I'll know what material I need to remove in order to have my blade end up in the right place. Next, we're going to do a little preliminary shaping. I'll be using a rasp and files to get the rough outline of the handle. We don't need it perfect yet, but by getting it close to where we want it, that'll help us shape the blade. So as I start filing the blade to shape, I'm going to slow down a little and talk about steel in a little bit of detail. High carbon steel, the kind of steel that I'm using for this project, is actually very similar to the kind of steel that would have been found in a toolmaker's shop, oh, 150 years ago. It's basically just iron and carbon. There's no chromium, no vanadium, no nickel, no molybdenum, no tungsten, all those things that are used in modern steel. Now, one implication of this is that it will rust. It's not a stainless steel, but it also means, and this is really important for this kind of project, it can be hardened without special equipment. Now it's important to understand that not all steel can be used for edge tools like knives. Some steels, mild steel, structural steel, welding steel, these are names for the kind of steel that you might see down at Home Depot or someplace like that. These kind of steels can't be hardened. Some steels can be hardened, some can't. Often you'll hear the word tempering used to describe this hardening process. Strictly speaking, this is an incorrect use of that term. So let me talk about the process and then what the real meaning of that word is. In order to harden the steel, the steel is brought to a high temperature. In the case of 1095, about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit or 800 Celsius. It's then cooled very rapidly, in this case by dunking it in oil. Now this rapid cooling process, known as quenching or hardening, causes the steel to go from a soft and fairly flexible state to a much harder and more brittle state. The steel at this point is still very hard, so it'll snap in half if you drop it or even just flex it a little. So a second heat treating process, known as tempering, is required. By heating the blade to a much lower temperature, in this case somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 degrees Fahrenheit, the steel softens slightly and becomes much more resilient, so it won't snap in half if you bend it a little. Again, that's the strict metallurgical meaning of tempering. We'll see how all that works in just a few minutes. But first, we'll shape the overall profile of the blade. It's going to be a small Warncliffe blade, meaning that it's flat on the cutting edge side and curved along the top. We do this by taking away a fair amount of material with the file. Now, all this filing might seem like kind of a chore, and frankly it is. It's way easier with a belt grinder, but it can be done with a file. I've made many knives this way over the years, and it's a very doable project just a little tiring. Before we shape that top curve though, we'll file in the bevels. That's the part that turns it from a bar shape into a knife shape. As you'll see, I've clamped it down here and I'm filing down that bevel by canting the file just a couple of degrees off of the plane of the bar of steel. I want the bevel to be the exact same angle from one end to the other. That way, when we file off the top curve, the blade gently slims down as it reaches the point. Okay, so now I've formed this chunk of steel into something resembling a blade. But it's still not a knife, not really. 
like I said, it's got to be hardened and tempered before it's ready for use. But first, let's do some cosmetic work. I'll use sandpaper to get rid of all the file marks. This is really about appearances. If you feel like spending enormous amounts of time here, you'll end up with something of gem-like perfection. But just because you can doesn't mean you have to. Custom knife makers lavish enormous amounts of time on their blades, getting them perfect. But if you just intend to use this as a working tool, you don't necessarily have to kill yourself on this step. All nice and pretty. So, now time for the magic heat treating. Any heat source that will get you to 1500 degrees will work here. Now, in some other videos I've done, and I'll leave links for you, I've shown this process with a charcoal fire, with an oxypropane torch, with a forge, but here I'm going to be using this somewhat uh, rustic Venturi burner that I made years ago out of a bunch of old plumbing parts. As you'll see, even this crappy looking piece of ironmongery will easily get the blade to a red heat which is what you're aiming for. I'm going as slowly and gingerly as I can. This is important. Overheating the blade, which is what happens if the blade gets to a bright orange, much less a yellow or white color, well, that'll do really bad things to the steel. As soon as the blade has uniformly reached the right color, I'll plunge it into a can full of peanut oil. Notice how I'm only putting the blade, not the tang, into the oil at least until the color is gone from the tang. I don't want to harden that part of the steel. Why? I'll need to file it a little further to get everything trued up, and if I harden it now, I'll wreck all my files. Important note, this kind of quenching process is very specific to a particular type of steel. It'll work with 1095 and a few other steels like 01 and 5160, but once you start talking about more heavily alloyed steels, stainless steels and things of that nature, this process won't result in properly hardened steel. So don't think that you can replicate what I did on just any old piece of steel and end up with a good knife blade. All right, everything appears to have worked out, so now I'll temper the steel. Old time smiths called this drawing or drawing the temper. I'm aiming to get the steel to about 400 degrees. When you heat steel, oxides form on the surface which color the steel. Different temps, different colors. So in order to see these colors, I just used a little bit of sandpaper to very quickly scrub off the oxides that formed on the blade during the heat treating. That way I can see these colors forming on the steel. I'm aiming for just a little bit of color, a golden straw color, which is the first colored oxide that forms, and that'll indicate that the blade is around 400 degrees. Easy does it here. If it turns dark brown, blue, or even purple, well, you've overshot and your blade will be softer than it should be, which means that it won't hold an edge very well. Now, I've overshot just a hair, because this is a very thin blade, but it's not too bad. Now, if you're trying to replicate what I'm doing here and you don't feel like being so persnickety about avoiding electrical power, hey, throw it in your kitchen oven at 400 degrees for an hour or two and you'll get the same result with less chance of screwing up. Now we'll do a little shaping on the handle. Now one of my basic strategies is to keep everything I do as screw up proof as possible. So I've kept my blank a little oversized to give me room for screw ups but now I'm ready to trim it closer to final thickness. Back to the old hand saw. I've clipped a piece of 80 grit sandpaper to a piece of aluminum plate. Now I'll just kind of scrub around on it, softening all the edges. You can do this all at once, but I do it in two stages because it helps me shape the blade and tang a little bit.
Now let's get the blade fixed up. I'll repeat more or less the same sanding process we used earlier to get the oxides off the blade which formed during heat treating. If you've done everything right the first time, this is a matter of just a few minutes work. If you want to, you can go up to 1,000, 1,500 grit, 2,000 grit, whatever you want, or you can use something like Scotch-Brite that'll give it a matte finish. Now it's time to secure the blade to the handle. I'm using some two-part epoxy mixed with sawdust, as much to fill the gaps here as to actually secure the blade. Using a handsaw to cut the slot is not exactly super accurate, so there's a little bit of ugly to fill in here. The real work of keeping the handle on goes to these two little pins. I'm using 303 stainless steel, but you could use brass, silver, nickel silver, whatever floats your boat. I've cut and then filed the pins so they're just barely, barely proud of the hole. In goes the epoxy. Then the pins. Now the heads of the pins are peened with a small cross peen hammer. By peening, I mean that I'm gently mushrooming the heads of these pins. Now that's going to create a mechanical lock, which will assure that the pins stay in position even if the epoxy fails. Now don't go buck wild here or you'll split the wood. You just want it to spread out a little bit so that it doesn't move. After the epoxy is cured, I'll clean up the entire design. Any little problems with the geometry, I'll fix them now. I don't like this hard little point underneath the blade, so I'm going to round that off. I'll soften the lines. If there's any chipping, uh, any of that kind of thing gets fixed now. I'll also file off the heads of those pins so that they're nice and flush. Then I'll finish up with sandpaper. I'll clean everything up with more sandpaper this time sanding all the way up to a thousand grit. So all of you woodworkers out there would probably know a million ways of finishing the wood. And if you're doing this project along with me, that's going to depend on what kind of wood you're using. In my case, this is an oily hardwood and they kind of have their own special rules. In my view, this general class of woods, ebony, cocobolo, rosewood, and so on, work in fairly similar ways, doesn't require a ton of finishing. Less is more. In fact, I'll just use some garden variety furniture wax following the directions to bring it to a nice sheen. Sharpen it up on my diamond stone. And there we have it, ready for some good old whittling. As you can see, it cuts paper nicely. Now any old crap steel can be sharpened. The question is, will it hold an edge after doing some real work? So let's bust out a piece of walnut. And the answer is yes, this blade holds up fine, still slicing paper after a good bit of whittling. That's a sign that everything's worked right. 
Now I'll wrap it up and give it to my friend so she can do some whittling herself. So I really enjoy this kind of project. It really takes us back to what we as craftsmen are all about, using our hands, using our mind to overcome the limitations of our equipment and uh, our materials. So really fun project for me. Um, and Kitty, I hope you enjoy the knife and I really look forward to seeing what you're gonna make with it. <laughs> Hey guys, if you found value in this video, I hope you'll consider partnering with the channel to help us bring more videos, better videos, more knives, more techniques, all that cool stuff. Click the link to Patreon to help this channel. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet, bro, what are you waiting on? And check me out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Also, if you're into Japanese swords, check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you'll see more of my work and where you'll find videos about the making of Japanese swords, along with mounting, fittings, polishing, hamones, all kinds of good stuff. Now, more videos.